Welcome everyone. We're just going to give it a minute for folks to join. Uh, if you want, we love to see where you're joining from. So if you wanna put in the chat uh, where you are currently, we usually get folks coming in from around the country. And excellent. Hi everyone. We've got folks from Connecticut, New York, Guilford, Oswego, Petersburg, Buffalo, Queens, Long Island. Oh, Ontario, Canada. This is great. We've got someone from Sharon, Connecticut. And my name happens to be Sharon. Rochester, oh, Michigan, great. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining. We've got folks coming in from St. Louis, Indiana, Brooklyn, New York, of course. So my name is Sharon and uh, I am the communications manager for Audubon, Connecticut and Audubon, New York. And it is my great joy to welcome you today to our monthly webinar. This month's webinar is an inside look at bird adaptations. Um, you know, have you ever wondered why some birds are red instead of yellow or have short or long beaks or, you know, why does word, one bird say, who cooks for you? And the other one says, drink your tea. Um, well, we hope to be able to answer some of these very important questions today. Um, on this webinar, you are going to learn how birds have adapted to live in specific habitats. Uh, you're going to discover the five major biomes of Connecticut and New York, although you'll find that you recognize a lot of them, I'm sure, and could apply them to uh, the wildlife in your own state. And uh, we are going to give you a bit of a virtual look at some of our Audubon Nature Centers here in Connecticut, New York, and the habitats they contain. And then ideally, you know, you can get out there and experience these birds in person because our trails are open. So this webinar is being recorded. Um, it will be immediately available on Facebook as soon as we're done, we're broadcasting live. Uh, so if anyone can't join us for the whole event, you can always go on our Audubon Connecticut, New York or National Audubon Society Facebook pages and see it there. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to our presenters, Yamina and Lily and let them take it away. Hello, I am Yamina. I am um, program coordinator for uh, an environmental education program called For the Birds at Audubon, New York. Um, and I will be leading you through um, the centers and sanctuaries of New York and Connecticut. And we'll be talking about how birds have adapted to, le to live in these different um, habitats. Uh, so before we get started, we're going to wake everyone up um, and break the ice of sorts, the virtual ice. Um, and let's take a second and caption this picture. So what do you think is happening in this picture? What do you think these two were saying to each other? So yeah, you can actually um, caption it, right? So what do you think these turkeys are saying? Um, so we can get as creative as, yeah, there we go. Um, oh yeah, these are a little risque. I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, hey honey, wanna have dinner is one of the cleaner ones. I'm glad the CDC canceled Thanksgiving's a good one. Um, need a wingman, question mark. Can I have the stands? Um, leave town by next Thursday. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, happy Thanksgiving. Not, I like that. Um, uh, <laughs> where are you hiding come tea day? Uh, what's your sign? Um, so yeah, I can't read some of these, uh, out loud because this is a family event, but these were really great captions. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, 
so we can uh, move on. Uh, thank you for your creativity and your sense of humor. Um, so uh, the first habitat we're gonna talk about is the forest. Um, and forests are characterized by trees, right? Lots and lots of trees. Um, they do have resources like water and food, which is important because birds need those things. Um, but there won't be a large enough body of water for fish eaters or filter feeders. Um, and this beautiful picture here with this magical double rainbow is bent of the river center um, in Connecticut. And so this is a 700 acre um, property here. It's mostly Eastern hardwood mix, uh, but unfortunately the ash have some succumbed to the emerald ash borer, which is an invasive beetle. Um, so unfortunately that's hurt some of the biodiversity of um, this habitat. Uh, so thinking about birds you can find in the forest, um, some examples here, scarlet tanager, and you can actually see the size of the bird there that is important. Um, and that, that measurement is from beak tip to tail tip. Uh, so we've got the scarlet tanager, that's a migratory bird. So unfortunately we're not gonna see it right now. We've also got a downy, which uh, will stay through the winter, so you can go out and see them. And so the reason I said size is important because there's not a lot of room to fly in the forest, right? Because of all those trees I mentioned. So birds in the forest typically are smaller uh, just so that they can navigate through those trees as they fly. Um, they have beaks that are meant for eating seeds um, and insects and nuts. Uh, their feet are actually adapted to that habitat. So on the left, we've got the scarlet tanager. It's got three toes in the front, one toe in the back, and that's great for perching, for grabbing onto those branches. And then the downy is going to have the two toes in the front and the two toes in the back. Uh, because it's a woodpecker, it has to climb up and down the tree and hold on. And you can see here it's upside down. Uh, so that helps it grab on. So everything about these birds is adapted to survive in this habitat. Um, so please excuse me, my dog is snoring and that's why I'm cracking up a bit. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with your sound. <laughs> um, uh, so we can also, um, we're going to actually at this point um, issue a poll, our first poll. Um, so let's test your knowledge right now. Um, so poll number one, hummingbirds are small and agile flyers. Do you think you will find them in dense forests? Uh, oh boy, we're really, so let's wait a few seconds, give everyone time to think about that. Again, hummingbirds are small and agile flyers. Do you think you'll find them in dense forests? Yes or no? I'm just gonna give everyone a few more seconds here to think about this. Um, most people have responded. Votes are still coming in. Now they're slowing down. All right, so uh, we look here, 41% uh, said yes, 60% said no. Uh, and so while hummingbirds are small, and agile, and we talked about how important that is, remember that they are nectar drinkers, right? So they need flowers to eat. Um, forests, of, because there are so many trees, typically there aren't too many flowers because they don't get enough sunlight. So you know, hummingbirds aren't really adapted to, find, um, to survive in a dense forest because they can't find their primary food source. So um, I believe we're actually gonna, uh, have another poll now um, as we transition to our other habitat. So, um, question number two. Marshes, swamps, bogs, and fens are examples of what kind of habitat? So are these examples of grasslands, wetlands, or coasts? Marshes, swamps, bogs, and fens are examples of what kind of habitat? So it looks like pretty much everyone has voted. 
Uh, I'll share the results. 97% said wetland, 1% said grassland, 4% said coastal. Uh, these are examples of wetlands and we're gonna learn about wetlands next. Um, so let me um, come back to the PowerPoint. All right, so great job everyone, by the way. Thank you for participating in our polls. Um, so wetlands, wetlands are wetland. They're areas of water that can support dense plant growth, um, which gives space for birds to perch or nest in. And as we just talked about, examples are marshes, swamps, bogs, and fens. Uh, this is a picture of Montezuma, uh, which is located in the Montezuma Wetlands Complex, um, 50,000 acres of wetlands. Um, and that's at the very tippy top of New York. Um, and let's talk about wetland birds. So birds that you can find in wetlands, uh, typically they're going to have these longer legs uh, and that's just so that they can walk through the mud and the water. Um, they're gonna have those long necks also so that they can get their food. They um, have these long beaks. Those are good for, again, going in that water and that mud. Um, to get their food. They have um, these larger feet, which uh, if you think about you're stepping in mud, you don't wanna get stuck. So feet like this, because the, the toes are so long, they're easier to pull out of the mud. Um, and then they're camouflaged by those tall reeds and tall grasses. Uh, so again, we're thinking about how these birds are very well adapted to this habitat. And you can also see, again, look at the size. So obviously great blue heron's a really big bird. Virginia rail is pretty large too. Um, so birds in the wetlands can be a bit bigger um, just because there's so much coverage and there's a lot of space. Um, we can move on to lakes, rivers, and streams. Um, so these are bodies of water that are too deep um, to move too swiftly. Um, and so they're usually empty in the middle. Um, this is Greenwich Audubon Center in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, so that center manages 686 acres on seven sanctuaries in Greenwich. Um, and A, it's a beautiful center. If you have not been, I highly recommend you go. Um, and B, there's a lot of biodiversity and a lot of habitats right there. So you've got um, seven miles of hiking trails, hardwood forest, lake, vernal pools for those herpers out there. Um, so there's a lot to see at Greenwich. Let's talk about birds in lakes, rivers, um, and streams. So these birds typically have webbed feet that's gonna help them swim. Um, their beaks, they either have fish eating beaks, which are pointed. So look at that loon that's got a fish eating beak or their filter feeders. Um, filter feeders are pretty cool. So they've got lamella on the side of their beaks and you can kind of see that in that sketch right there. Um, and if you think about uh, how whales eat, they've got those bristles that kind of look like a broom. Um, so filter feeders will either, you know, move their head side to side um, and just like hold in the food and let the water go out or they'll just sort of like suck everything up. Um, they'll use their tongue to push out the water and the food stays in their beak. Very complicated way to eat, but pretty handy when you're getting lots of little plants and um, macro invertebrates and fish from the water. Um, they make their nests either floating in the body of water or they use the reeds that grow along the banks of the water. Um, so yeah, these are, that's on the left, you've got the absolutely stunning wood duck. Um, and on the right, you've got the common loon, which is always a treat to, to listen to when you can. Moving on, we're talking about grasslands. Uh, so grasslands are large areas that are covered in grasses, shrubs, or flowers. Um, they, these habitats occur for one of two reasons. So either um, a forest has been disturbed by something like a fire 
in which case that grassland is just temporary habitat and it will turn back into a forest uh, in, in a few decades or the soil is too poor to support tree growth and that's why grasslands are sort of wide empty fields. Um, here we're looking at a picture of uh, Sharon Audubon Center in Sharon, Connecticut. Um, and so yeah, you've got lots of fields and meadows with beautiful native wildflowers, very important to all of our pollinators. Um, and they do kestrel nest box monitoring there, which is also pretty awesome. Looking at grassland birds. Uh, so you've got birds like this bobolink here and um, this northern harrier, which is a raptor, um, absolutely beautiful raptor characterized by that, by that owl-like face. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so um, birds in the grasslands, they're gonna eat those um, seeds that grow on those tall grasses. Um, the raptors are gonna eat small mammals and they're gonna eat meat um, from also hiding in those tall grasslands. Uh, they're typically bigger than forest birds because again, they've got all of that space. Um, and again, the sizes are there. That's important when you're answering questions in the future, hint, hint. Um, and typically because there aren't trees, they nest in the grass. Um, so both this bobolink and this Northern Harrier actually nest on the ground, um, which is pretty cool because it's nice and protected by all of those tall grasses. Uh, let's move on to coasts. So coasts are where water meets the land. Uh, so most people think of the beach. Um, so coasts, unfortunately, are threatened um, as suitable habitats because of human development climate change. And this is for birds, but it's also for people, uh, as, we, as we've learned recently. Uh, these habitats are usually sandy or rocky. Um, and while there are plants that grow there, they're typically smaller. Um, so we're looking at a picture of Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary and Audubon Center in Oyster Bay, New York. Um, this, the Be A Good Ed program runs out of here. Um, this is a great program um, that gets people to um, be aware and of uh, being respectful of birds that nest on the beach. Um, they, people pledge to be respectful of those birds. They pledge to um, not litter because that garbage can end up in the bellies of those cute little babies on the net, on the beach. Um, and also people promise to keep their dogs off um, these nesting beaches because dogs can disturb the, the birds when they're nesting. So either they won't incubate their eggs or once the babies hatch, they won't get enough food. So it's pretty sad, but Be A Good Egg is a really great way to learn more about what you can do to help um, beach nesting birds. Uh, speaking of which, um, some of these birds like the oyster catcher and the piping plover, um, again, you've got those longer legs so that they can walk in the water. Um, their feathers might not necessarily be um, as waterproof as a duck's feathers, so they don't necessarily want to get them wet. So that's why they've got those long legs. They've got those longer beaks that are good for probing in the sand um, for insects or for more macroinvertebrates like crabs. Um, and they're um, a little bit bigger than, sorry, they're typically smaller, whoop, wrong way. They're typically smaller than wetlands birds. Um, so again, American oyster catcher and the very cute piping plover, which definitely needs our help. Um, and so I think we are moving on to another poll. Um, so, We are going to completely switch gears um, and we're going to talk about bird song. So, do you think high or low pitch sounds travel better through dense vegetation? So we're thinking about dense vegetation. Do you think high pitch or low pitch sounds travel better? Um, lots of people are answering. 
this is a toughie. I only learned this recently myself. So do we think high pitched or low pitched sounds travel better through dense vegetation? All right, so I'm gonna stop polling. A lot of people have voted. Uh, I'm gonna share the results. So 57% think high pitched sounds travel better through dense vegetation. 43% think low pitched sounds travel better through dense vegetation. Um, I'm going to hold the suspense a little bit till we get to the next slide. So <laughs> high pitch sounds have shorter wavelengths and they're more easily stopped by solid objects. So if you're a bird with a high pitch sound, you're going to want to sing at the top of the tree. Um, low pitch songs bounce better past solid objects like dense vegetation. So low pitch songs would um, travel further in dense vegetation. So if you chose low pitched, um, you got it right. And if you didn't, that's totally fine too. Cause like I said, I just learned this. Um, also choppy and repetitive songs um, travel very well in dense vegetation too. And that's key. Cause we're gonna, gonna test you on that in a bit. Uh, this is a picture of Buttercup Farm um, Audubon Sanctuary which is in New York. So <laughs> uh, I promised there would be a test. Here it is. We're going to listen to some songs and we are going to decide which one we think would travel better through dense vegetation. So let's, um, let's get our listening ears on. Let's listen to song number one. Oop, give me a sec. Okay. All right, that was song number one. We're gonna listen to song number two now. So again, the question is, which one of these two songs do you think would travel better through dense vegetation? And I'm about to launch that poll. Um, and while you're answering it, I can actually, can I? I can play the songs again. So this is number one again. And we can listen to song number two again. All right, so I'm gonna end polling. 30% um, of you said sound one would travel better through dense vegetation and 70% said sound two would travel better. Um, so again, I'm just gonna keep you in suspense in this for a second. Um, so actually, uh, if you voted for sound two, um, you are correct. Remember I said um, sharp, um, quick, abrupt, sort of like machine gun like sounds travel better through dense vegetation. Um, and then that like high pitched whistle um, is gonna carry better um, and, and further, right? So you, this is an olive sided flycatcher. Um, you would be able to hear this for about a mile away. Um, and for those of you who are working on your bird song, the mnemonic device for the olive sided flycatcher is um, quick three beers. Um, and there is none for the marsh, marsh run because I can't imitate that sound. Um, so again, this is Buttercup um, Farm Sanctuary, which is a pretty great place. Uh, this is the wetland um, 
part of it, but uh, it also has grasslands too. So it's a really beautiful spot. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, this is where I'm going to pass things on to my colleague, Lily, uh, who is going to continue the presentation. Yes, great. Thank you, Yumina. So um, for this next portion of the presentation, we are going to uh, kind of practice what we've just learned. So let's take a look at the first question. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so our first question is, which raptor are you more likely to find hunting in the forest? So we have a bald eagle, a sharp-shinned hawk, and a barn owl. And if you noticed, uh, we included another measurement. So WS stands for wingspan. Um, so you mean you can decide when to close the polls. All right, just a few more seconds. Uh, they're coming in a little bit slower. All right, and I can share the results right now. Okay, so 1% said bald eagle, 66% of people said the sharp-shinned hawk, and 33 said barn owl. So um, we can go to the next slide and take a look at the answer. So the answer is sharp-shinned hawk. So um, on the previous slide, we saw that the sharp-shinned hawk had the smallest wingspan out of the three birds. And sharp-shinned hawks are very agile and acrobatic flyers. And they're able to um, navigate dense woods at high speeds. And they do this by using their long tails as a rudder. Um, and if you want, you can actually also uh, take a look at um, the Northern goshawk, it's like a relative, it's a bigger, fiercer, kind of more wild relative of the sharp hawk. And they're kind of uh, referred to as the master of the forest because they are really good at flying through forests as well. And there are really cool videos online that actually show you this. So if you have some time, I recommend checking out those videos. Um, so the I wanted to kind of display the, our Prospect Park Audubon Center to um, kind of showcase how we do have uh, Audubon centers in urban areas. And this is actually the first urban area Audubon center in the nation. Um, and about half of the park's 585 acres is actually woodland. And it's the last remaining forest in Brooklyn. So, um, so even if you live in a city, you definitely have access to Audubon centers and nature where you can see birds. Okay, uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so for our next question, we're going to decide which of these two sounds would travel better through reeds in a marsh. So if you could please play sound number one. And sound number two. So do you think sound number one or sound number two would travel better through reeds in a marsh? Um, so some people are asking if you could play it again. Of and course. Also, I think some people said it was hard to hear, so I'm not sure if we can adjust the volume at all. I can certainly try. Um, okay, so let's, sorry, I'm doing a million things at once. And I'll play it in just a second. Sorry, okay, so this is one. Okay. And 
This is two. Alright, so I'm gonna... Mm, that caused a little bump in votes, so I'm gonna give people a chance to... to cast their vote. Alright, I'm gonna end polling and I'll share the results. Okay, so 66% uh, said sound one and 34% said sound two. So we can go ahead to the next slide and look at the answer. Oh, well, it doesn't say the answer. I have to tell you the answer. So the answer was sound number one would travel better. So that's a common yellow throat. And it sings kind of a choppy, repetitive song. And it's really designed to kind of travel through the reeds well. Um, and uh, so, and our other bird, the cedar waxwing, wouldn't really kind of, wouldn't really sing in the marsh, but maybe flying by. This bird is flying by, heading to a tree with some berries, and it's making its little uh, kind of uh, wispy, whistly sound that would not really tra travel well through dense veg vegetation. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, everyone. I think I forgot to mention that was a picture from Constitution Marsh. Uh, one of our centers in New York. Okay, so for our next question, we have, this says, this bird is about the size of an American Robin. Based on the size, the beak and the feet, which habitat do you think this bird is best suited for? So if we take a look at the beak, maybe look at the shape and the length and look at the feet and the size clue, um, which bird, I mean, sorry, which habitat do you think this bird is best suited for? Okay, so let's look at the results. So I think most people said coast um, and then some people also said wetland. That was the second most uh, chosen answer. So let's take a look at our next slide. So that bird was actually a sanderling and you would find this bird on the coast most likely. Um, and if we take a look at the um, the the bill, it has a stout bill and it's about the same length of its head. And this, this kind of beak is good for probing the sand for food. Um, and then obviously, as we saw in the previous slide, it did not have web feet. So you would not find this bird swimming in the water trying to get food. Instead, this bird it will, is on the coast, on the shoreline, uh, trying to find food in the sand. And often you will find it kind of um, kind of running back and forth to avoid the waves. Um, and this picture here is a picture of Stratford Point. This is managed by Audubon, Connecticut. And you can definitely find sanderlings and other shorebirds here. And if you take a closer look at this picture, you can uh, see these kind of circular structures with holes in them. So those are reef balls. And um, what they're doing is they're actually trying to create an artificial reef and they're doing this because they want to help stop the shoreline from eroding. And they've actually found that it does help prevent shoreline erosion and it also is actually helping to reverse it. So next slide, please. Okay, so for our next question, we have a bird that is about the size of the American crow and based on the size, the beak type, and the feet and leg length, what habitat do you think this bird is best suited for?
And if you have uh, some extra time, you've already answered the poll question, feel free in the chat to just answer a bonus question, which is um, what are uh, those little projections inside of the bill called? So in this picture, the close up of this picture here, you can kind of see them. So if anyone remembers the name. Can you see my mouse if I do this? And, yes, you, we can see your mouse. And spelling doesn't count, so don't worry about that. Okay, I'm seeing some good answers. So everyone was paying attention. Um, are, we, are we done with this poll? Okay. Okay, so most people answered lake and some people thought maybe wetland or coast. So next slide. So uh, that was um, those uh, pictures from the previous slide. Those were the beak and the feet from a northern shoveler. And most likely you would find this bird in a lake swimming and dabbling and looking for food in the water. And um, as you can see with the northern shoveler, it has a, a pretty large flat kind of spoon or even shovel shaped bill. And obviously it has webbed feet, so it's a good swimmer. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is going to be our last question. So for this one, it says that it's a large bird and you can often find them walking and they can actually run up to 25 miles per hour. And despite what some people may think of how they fly or think of their flying ability, they actually can fly up to 55 miles per hour. And if needed, they can even swim. And they like to make their nests on the ground in dead leaves. What habitat do you think this bird would be in? So there are lots of clues in here. So just kind of have to pick them out. Do people still need a little more time, Yamina? Uh, yeah, answers are starting to slow down. I'm gonna give okay. people a few more seconds. But yeah, they're still coming in though. All right, I'm gonna close polling and share the results. Um, so most people chose mixture of open areas and forests. And second most popular choice was grassland followed by wetland. Do we wanna have people try to figure out what bird this is? Okay, yeah, sure. Let's in the chat, if you feel like you have an idea what bird this is, feel free to type it in. I think someone already made a guess. Someone said pheasant. So pheasant, turkey, timber doodle. <laughs> yeah. So I'm seeing some very good guesses here. <laughs> okay, I think we can reveal the answer. So the bird was actually a wild turkey. And uh, so turkeys, the best habitat for them includes a mixture of woodlands and open areas. And um, so this is a picture of Buttercup. So Buttercup also has um, some fields and some woodlands there. And uh, so quick story, um, Yamina and I, we go to Buttercup during the summer to do bobolink surveys. So one time we were there doing our bobolink survey, walking on one of the trails. It was really quiet. And then all of a sudden we heard this like loud noise and we, we got scared. And it turned out to be a turkey 
jumping out of the bushes and running away from us. So we got scared by this turkey and this turkey was also scared by us and it just ran away incredibly quickly. And um, so one interesting thing about turkeys, apparently when threatened, female turkeys tend to fly away while male turkeys tend to run away. So I suppose the turkey we saw could have been a male turkey in that case. And one final thing on the turkey. So in the previous slide, uh, we said that they can swim if needed. So uh, it might be a really odd image to imagine a turkey swimming. So let me tell you how they do it. So they, um, they tuck in their wings really close to their bodies and then they spread their tails out and then they just start kicking with their feet. Okay, I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so th that is it. I'm gonna pass it back to Sharon. Hi everyone. Uh, so thanks again for joining. I actually forgot to mention at the beginning that we always do have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, and I just want to remind any everyone that uh, this webinar is being recorded and it is actually broadcasting live on Facebook right now. So if you go to Audubon New York or Audubon Connecticut on Facebook, even if you don't have a Facebook account, you can rewatch the video. Um, so we did get a few questions in the chat as we were going. Um, and we can start to answer some of those now. If you have questions and you want to stay on, we can hopefully address them. Yamina and Lily, if you want to come on video, uh, we can get interactive here. And um, one of the first questions that I saw uh, was a question from Katie. And Katie asked, uh, why are coastal birds smaller than wetland birds? Um, and I will just preface all of that by saying that, you know, we certainly don't expect you to have all the answers to all the questions. <laughs> um, but if you do happen to have an answer, uh, now's the time folks can put your questions into the chat and we'll do our best. That's a really great question, and I won't pretend to know the answer. We can certainly hypothesize why we think that. Right. I mean, obviously, when we're talking about what birds are most likely to find in these habitats, we're kind of making the guidelines. These aren't, you know, strict. Obviously, there are some birds in certain habitats that don't follow these guidelines. But I think if we think about it in general, like if you think about a heron or an egret, um, you know, they're waiting in the wetlands. And it kind of makes sense that they would be larger. I mean, you're not going to see like, I feel like, I don't know. Like what, that, yeah. that uh, the oyster catcher we saw, its legs are shorter. So it's not, it's not like out, so it's either swimming in the water, flying or like on the coastline. Whereas those wetlands birds are literally walking through the water. Um, and you'll see them walking like deeper out in the middle. Um, I wonder also if like migration distance has something to do with it. Um, just like energy, energy use. Uh, and again, this is all me theorizing. Um, and just like having like, just having to float in the water. Um, right, we're having like, some people in the comments actually trying to help us out here. Yeah, so no, I love it. Um, so Lily and I said, yeah. um something about you know, their food size. So, you know, like the great blue heron, they're gonna eat fish, you know, sanderlings, piping plovers. They're not eating things that are that large. Right. Someone else said something about walking on vegetation, I think. Uh, I, I lost it in the comments because people keep typing. Um, but quickly, I just wanted to answer a question that I saw earlier. Um, someone asked me the answer to the bonus question. Yes, you're right. I never actually told you the answer to the bonus question. Um, so, Yamina, do you want to say it? It is lamella or lamellae. Um, yeah, so those, that's that filter that the birds have that kind of look like teeth, but are not teeth. <laughs> 
Great. Well, I mean, the two of you are welcome to look through the chat too. I'm seeing a lot of great questions. Um, question that came up is obviously a lot of, um, there, there is still a lot of bird life in New York and Connecticut right now, although our migratory birds in the winter. So who, who can you see at your feeder or in the forest or on the coast right now? So feeder, I mean, I don't know if we just put out an article about how it's an eruption year for um, uh, pine siskin, and it looks like there's a lot of red, uh, red poles coming through too, and even like some crossbills are popping up, not necessarily at your feeder, but it's an eruption year for all these different types of finches. Um, so, uh, and, um, oh, evening grow speak too. Um, so this could be the year to get those at your feeder. And then um, it's weird duck season, right? Coming up soon. So you'll get all of the ducks who nest um, north um, uh, coming down this is their south, so they'll overwinter here. Sorry, in the chat, I saw someone ask what I meant by, so it's not eruption like a like a volcano, it's eruption with an I. Um, and it just means that there's like an abundance of this bird's food. Um, and so like, you'll go through cycles where like, obviously plants affect birds. So if you get like an abundance of this food, bird's food source, you're gonna get lots more of those birds coming through. So this year we're getting lots more finches because of their food is more abundant. <laughs> Lily, did I miss anything? Um, in terms of birds you can see at your feeders. I mean, you know, uh, nuthatches, woodpeckers, chickadees, and obviously finches, like you mentioned. So I, I actually see a question that's uh, somewhat related to you, Mina, your comment about eruptions. Um, someone asked why they're seeing American oyster catchers at a beach this year where they've never seen them before. And I thought that was an interesting question um, given COVID and how people are experiencing the outdoors. So if either of you wants to address that. Um, well, I think we actually didn't, we were on some webinar and they talked about uh, coastal birds and oyster catchers and uh, piping plovers and um, you know so this during COVID there were lots of beaches that were closed so people didn't have access to them and so at certain beaches for the first time these birds started nesting there because they were you know undisturbed by people um, so maybe due to you know less people going fewer people going to that beach maybe um, that's why you're seeing the oyster catchers. Um, what do you what, what do you think, Yamina? Yeah, no, that makes sense. So you've got um, depends on the beach, right, and how it was used. But some beaches did see um, more birds nesting, like the oyster catcher, or more plovers nesting. Um, also depends also on uh, dogs, right? So I mentioned how dogs will disturb nesting birds. So if you've got less of them. Um, this is, I mean, this was a, we watched a presentation on an ongoing study. So obviously this is just one year's worth of data. So I think they need more, but it seemed like birds were really yeah, affected by, by COVID uh, positively, looks like. <clears throat> right, let me know if there's a question that you see that you want to address. I'm looking through them now, coming in fast and furious. <laughs> um, um, someone asked, should I put out my fears and sue it now? And I would say the answer is yes. Great, thank you all. Oh, here's an interesting one. And again, you know, if you don't know the answer, it's okay. But uh, why are certain birds eggs a particular color, like why are robin's eggs blue? Do we know anything about that in the sense of adaptations? I'm not sure if I'm able to answer exactly why robin's eggs are blue, but I can say that um, birds can recognize if there is an egg in their nest that is not does not belong there. So color does matter for uh, eggs. So um, let's say, you know, a 
brown headed cowbird lays an egg in another bird's nest and then this other bird returns and finds it, they'll, you know, try to get rid of it. But at the same time, brown headed cowbirds have also adapted and they can make their eggs look more like the eggs of whatever species they're trying to, you know, put their egg, eggs in their nest. So I'm not sure exactly about the blue part. You mean that? I know. Is it is it a diet thing? Am I making that up? I feel like diet has something to do with it. But I also acknowledge that I could be completely making stuff up. Well, how about this? Uh, some folks are asking about bird song. So what would be your suggestion of you know some of the best ways to learn bird songs? Go out and bird. <laughs> um, or, you know, however you enjoy observing birds. Um, so over, co like when the pandemic started, I would go to my local um, patch, uh, my, my local park and I would bird it every day. And I would get, I got familiar with the birds that were there. Um, and this was before migration and then migration started and I started hearing new songs um, and, and I had to work on those new songs. So just listening to birds as much as possible is really the way to do it. Folks are putting some some great suggestions in the comments. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Audubon and Cornell uh, all have bird calls on our website. So if you're you know trying to learn about a particular bird song, um, you can look up that bird at um, on on our ID pages and and listen to their songs. Um, we're going to put a link to an article in the chat now too about birding by ear. Um, it's a it's an eight part series, so I'll put that in now. Uh, but there are plenty of plenty of options for you. I I was once told that someone got a couple of records with bird song just listen to the records over and over and that's how they got to know uh, what bird makes which sound. Um, great, so let's see. Uh, anyone have any last minute questions? We have about two more minutes left and then we're gonna close down for the night, but thank you to everyone for joining. Um, Mary asked uh, what phone apps are helpful for bird ID. Audubon actually has uh, an ID app. If you, it's available in, in the Apple store uh, if you search for National Audubon. And um, maybe we'll end with one of uh, the most popular species. A question from Jacqueline, how can I attract hummingbirds to my yard? <laughs> Well, I get the best way would be to put up nectar feeders. Yeah, and if you- and um, planting native flowers, but there you like go. that is more effort for most people having, <laughs> but, but obviously also an option. Yeah, I was just gonna plug plants for birds. That's why I was gonna mention that. Um, if you have the space for it, even if it's just like a window container, um, you can use the plants for birds um website uh that we have um and you can plug in your um zip code and it will tell you what plants are native to that area and it'll tell you what those plants will attract um and it'll tell you i think where you can buy those plants so it's very very handy um always recommend it obviously yeah nectar feeder is great uh but um native plants help all pollinators so i saw someone mention something about butterflies um, it's a pollinator too, right? So bees and, and hummingbirds and all that fun stuff are attracted to native plants. Um, so however you can put up any plant garden, any, any flower gardens do it. I have a tiny container outside my window. I love it. It does the trick. Thank you, Mina and Lily. Right, I, I have to remember that uh, you're based in New York City, so not quite as much room for native plants um, and, and we actually have some good suggestions in the chat for uh, different options, butterfly weed and, and whatnot. Um, but you, yes, you can go on Audubon's um, native plants database, search for plants by your zip code and 
Um, I'm just laughing at folks telling us funny things in the chat. Um, and right, of course, there there isn't a good chance that you'll get a hummingbird now, but come spring, uh, much better opportunity. So thank you everyone for joining us. We've got a lot of folks thanking Lily and Yamina in the chat. We really appreciate it. Again, this was being recorded and it is available on Facebook uh, via Audubon New York, Audubon Connecticut, or the National Audubon Society. And we look forward to seeing you next month for another inside look. So until then, happy Thanksgiving to all, however you're celebrating and um, hope everyone stays safe. Thanks for joining. Bye everyone. <laughs>